Good morning. This is fun. This is more like Mondobi size. I feel super comfortable. Yeah. So we'd all have to be like in a little class. Never mind. I'm Adam. Um, Pastor Kim will be back, so don't panic shortly. Do we have any visitors? Uh-oh. I just want to tell you, young lady, that the real pastor is better, and so come back next week, and you will experience, you will experience that. So, Awesome. Uh, this morning, uh, we as a pastoral team are beginning a new series that we planned a couple of months ago on conflict. Um, and my assigned conflict slash offense topic was conflict with God or offense with God. Um, that sounds kind of odd to you or blasphemous. <laughs> That's what I thought uh, it is. Uh, and so I'm not sure what Pastor Kim wanted me to do with it, but that's the message. If that's you, stop it. Um, that's the entirety. So you jot that down in your notes, and if you have to leave early, you have uh, the message in your grasp. Uh, if you're offended with the Lord, just knock it off. Um, that's it. But I'm going to talk for another hour, so hopefully. Okay, so conflict, conflict with God. Conflict with God began um, in the Garden of Eden. It began in Genesis 3. We have Adam and Eve. Uh, they're immortal. They have everything they could possibly want. There is no striving. There is no stress, no anxiety, no fear. There are no needs uh, that they could possibly want. Everything is provided in perfect joy. They're walking in the physical presence of the Lord in the garden, um, and all is going well until they see that dang tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they see the fruit, um, and they want it. Right? They see that it's good. They see that it, is, that it can make one wise. They see uh, from the lips of the serpent that if they eat of it, they could be like God. Um, and in their heart, these, this desire was born, this desire uh, for more. And they said, I want more. I deserve more. God, you're withholding uh, something from me that I deserve, and I want it. Um, and that is the heart of conflict. And that's what we're going to talk about today. It's simply that, is all of our conflict, of all of our supposed offense with the Lord arises from that thought that, God, I deserve more than what you're giving me. I deserve better than what or how my life has turned out. And the message is still stop it if you're confused. Okay, so we're, this is illustrated for us in the story of John the Baptist. From John 3, chapter 26, let me read you a passage. It says, And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing, and all are going to him. Basically, they just say, Rabbi, look, everybody's leaving you. They're all uh, leaving you. John had given his life for this, if we know about John the Baptist. He had taken uh, the Nazarene vow. He had um, withheld himself, abstained from foods and from pleasure and from relationships, all seeking to honor uh, God. He had given his life to prepare the way for the Lord Jesus. And of John, uh, Jesus said that um, among those born of women, none is greater than John. No one in all of human history is greater than this man, uh, John the Baptist. <laughs> it's crazy. That's what he says. And so when John is looking out, knowing what he had done, knowing what he had poured into, and seeing that all he had built, his destiny, everything that his life had pointed to was going away, and at the prompting of his disciples, I'm sure the thought crept in like, hey, you deserve better than this. You deserve more than this. But at this moment in John's, John's life, he gives us a great answer. Verse 29, it says, The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, I must decrease. I love it. John's reply isn't, I'm disappointed. He says, look, Jesus is the groom. I'm not the groom. He says, Jesus is the Messiah. He's the groom, the bride, the people, the world. Everything is his. I'm just a friend of the groom. My role at a wedding is not for everyone to look at me or to make much of me or to follow after me or to chant my, my name. My role at the wedding is just to stand and to watch and behold the bride and the bridegroom to rejoice in them. And he says that line that we all can uh, take heart of at <laughs> he must increase and I must decrease. Same at a wedding. 
Take your eyes off of me and look at them. And that's what John says, that I must get smaller and he must get greater, both in my life and in everyone else's life. And the greater he gets and the more glory that the Lord receives, the greater John's joy was. I love it. And that's the heart of killing offense. That's sort of point one-ish. Point one is, in every situation, our greatest concern, our greatest goal should become, is for us to become less and for God to become more. Any situation is that people would see the wonder of who Jesus is. Whether it's a good situation or a bad situation, whether it brings heartache or brings happiness, that we would point uh, to Jesus. Okay, and so when John is thrown in prison, as we know, his, his faith begins to, to teeter-totter a little bit. He had just made this great statement, one that we should, that we should hang much of, uh, much of our lives on. Um, but then when he's in prison, things begin to change. And he sends two of his disciples to Jesus to ask them a question. And the question he asks is, from Luke seven nineteen. it says, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? John, I thought you just said this dude was the Messiah. I thought you just said your greatest joy in life is to look at him and to hear his words. But that's what happens when we're in prison, right? That's what happens when it's dark and and we don't know what's going on and it isn't what we expected. And for John, it isn't what he expected. The the kingdom of Jesus did not come in the way anyone expected. They thought he was going to usher in his reign and kick out the Romans and set up his kingdom. John didn't expect to be in Jesus. And so in that time of disappointment when he wanted more than what he was receiving, he says, are you the Messiah or do I look or should I look for someone else? Because if you were the Messiah, what am I doing in prison? Right? Why haven't you answered my prayers? Why haven't you removed me from this situation? And so our conflict with God arises when we don't heed the words um, of John, that less of me and more of him. Otherwise, we let the creeping thoughts, those thoughts that come in and say, I deserve more, I deserve better. And then when those expectations of what we deserve aren't met, then we're offended and we're offended at God. It's... (laughs) We're offended at the Almighty. It's just, it, it sounds silly to say, but we all live. We all live in that world, being offended um, at God. And we have all kinds of examples you can think from your own life. I could think from mine. Uh, when our health isn't the way we want it, and I pray, and it's still junk, <laughs> we're offended. Why aren't I healed? You know, or I'm, I'm tithing, you know, well, occasionally. Pretty occasionally, wife. So I'm tithing, um, You know, and we're still short on a bill. And we're like, well, what the heck, God? I'm doing this thing pretty good, you know, giving it my all when we're offended. And and when we have relationships, whether it's marriages or with kids or whatever, and and we're trying to do it God's way and still there's struggle and still it doesn't turn out the way we want it and and we get we get offended. Or or maybe in our in our workplace or serving at church, we're we're serving, we're giving our time and we don't get any recognition and we just want more. We just want something. We feel like we deserve. Um, And so we're offended, just like John was offended in jail. And Jesus' response both to uh, him and to us is found in verse 22. This is what Jesus says. He says, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Blessed is the one who is not offended offended by me. It's like Jesus says to John, I know John, because I'm Jesus, I know John uh, that it hasn't turned out the way uh, that you had hoped, right? But he says, blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Don't be offended, John. Don't be offended. And as I was thinking about that, I mean, we might expect Jesus to say, John, I love you, because he surely does. John, remember, you're the greatest, just push on through because he was. We maybe would have expected Jesus to say to John, just hold on in prison, I'll come and rescue you. I'll come and get you out. But he doesn't. He just says, he just says, don't be offended. And in the part that says the blind see and the lame walk and the dead are raised, all these miracles, Jesus isn't saying to John, look at my power, look what I can do. Trust in me and hold on and I will get you out of prison. He's just saying, look, John, I have just fulfilled messianic promises. I am the Messiah, he says. I am the Son of God. That's, that's what he tells John. That's his response. I have come. I have come. Am I the groom or are you the groom? Is it about me or is it about you? That's what he says to John. I am Jesus. Rejoice in me. That's what he said. 
I love it. I love it. Less of us, more of him in every situation. Is it him or is it me? Is it his glory or my glory? It's his every time. Um, in Scripture, we have a story um, in all three of the synoptic gospels of the rich young ruler. And in the story, as you guys know, we see the rich young ruler, and he comes before Jesus, and he falls down on his knees before him, and he says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And through the interplay, through the dialogue, we find out that this ruler had been pious, and he had kept the commandments uh, since his birth, that he was earnest and desiring and seeking eternal life. And when he came to Jesus asking, what shall I do to get it? Jesus' response was this. He says, one thing you still lack, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasures in heaven and come and follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad for he was extremely rich. He's saying like, look, I want to be saved, Jesus, obviously. Who doesn't want to go to heaven? Because the other place is worse, so we pick heaven. I want to go to heaven. It sounds better. Um, I've kept the commandments. Um, and what else must I do? Uh, because I really want to do that. I, I, will, I will follow your book, and I will obey some of them. Um, and Jesus says, look, I want you to give it all. I want you to give it all. I want you to give your money. I want you to give your time. I want you to follow me. And he's like, I'm unprepared to do that. I'm unprepared. I'm prepared to do some of the things. I'm not prepared to do that. I'm prepared to love you a little bit. I'm not prepared to give up my wealth or my power. I'm not prepared to make my life about you, Jesus, because I like my life being about me. That's essentially what he says. And we do. We live in that world all the time. Like, Sunday when I wake up and I'm like, I just don't want to go to church. And Jolene's like, you have to. You're the pastor. <laughs> it's exhausting. No, I'm kidding. Um, right? <laughs> But we're like, we're like, Jesus, you know, I'll go, I'll go to church a couple times a month or I'll go to church on Sundays, but like, don't think I'm going to fast and pray on a Thursday night. Like, let's not get crazy here. You know, it's, I'm going to sing these songs, you know, before service, but, but don't think you can have my leisure time on Saturday because, because that's mine. And, and we give this sort of, this faith, the mental ascent with our brain. Jesus, I know that you died on the cross for my sins. I know that you're enthroned in heaven, but my heart and my life and my passions and my desires and my stuff like that, <laughs> that's where it's at. That's my concern. That's mine. Keep your hands off because my concern is for me and not for the glory of God. And that's a world we live in. That was what John the Baptist struggled with in prison. Uh, that was the garden of Adam and Eve. That's was their struggle. And it's, Jesus, I want you, but I want this too. And frankly, if the two collide and I have to pick one, I want this. I want this rather than you, because, and when he takes it, or when he asks for it, or when we don't get what we think we deserve, we become, we become offended, offended at God. And there's hundreds of verses in the Bible that talk about the truth of the gospel, which is that Jesus came to be more than just our Savior. You know, that Jesus came and he means to be Lord and King of our lives. Lord and King of our lives. It's sort, of a, it's sort of an all or nothing kind of a deal. Sort of an all or nothing deal. He's king or not, he's Lord or he's no Lord at all. There really is no thing in between. And he means to be the Lord of our lives. Luke 9, 20 through 24 says, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. Jesus, he just stands there and he, he declares to us, look, I'm offering you everything. I'm offering you eternal life, he says to us. I'm offering you peace and forgiveness and hope that you can never, never know. I'm offering you new and glorified bodies and glory that you cannot, in your wildest of dreams, imagine what I have prepared for you forever. But he says, in this life, in this life, I mean to have it all. I mean to have your life. And if you're like, what's that have to do with offense? I mean, hopefully it's clear that that's sort of the secret uh, to offense. The secret to offense. Because we come before God with lots of prayers and lots of petitions. And most of our prayer requests about wealth and health and relationships and pleasure and leisure and the job and the other stuff, most of those things we have no inherent 
um, right to, you know, no inherit right to. And if we have no right to those things, then we have no reason to be offended. Does that make sense? The reason that we have no right to be offended is because Jesus purchased it all. He bought it all. He bought it all on the cross. The day that we got on our knees, the day that he opened our eyes by the power of his Holy Spirit to the truth and the reality of who he was, and we saw ourselves in our sinful condition, um, and we hopefully with tears of both remorse over our sin and what it cost Jesus and tears of joy over what it means to be forgiven and free and about to go to glory, <laughs> and we just would say, in joy, we're saying to Jesus, like, if you would take me, <laughs> I'm yours. I'm yours. At least that's what my heart says. There shouldn't be an if you will take me. He will take you, but, but the magnitude of it, God, if you would take me, I'd be yours. And then there's no cause for offense. There's no cause for offense. Uh, there's a story that you probably heard. I think Pastor Kim shared it, um, but I'm going to share it again. And then there's another story that Pastor Kim shared that I will also share again. So if you ever heard Pastor Kim, you've heard the rest of the sermon, and so it will be a good review. Um, the story is about a rich young ruler who did indeed sell it all, um, and he was a German fella named Count Zinzendorf. I know it's a great name. Reminds me of something that I said first service, but I'm not going to say it. It was funny, though. Anyway, he's a German noble. Um, he was born uh, in 1700, and he's an aristocrat. He's, he's a count, and when he's about 20-ish, he's touring Germany to see all that was going to be his, all of his lands, all of his holdings. Um, it was a part of his uh, grand tour, um, as they called it. And he was touring a museum in um, Dusseldorf, which uh, this also sounds like something funny. I'm not going to say. Sounds like Harry Potter, doesn't it? Doesn't all this stuff sound like Harry Potter? Sorry, Zinzendorf, Dusseldorf. Anyway, I don't like Harry Potter. I just thought it was funny. I'm going to take a water break. There's a guy, and he's looking at a painting in a museum. That's where we're at. Good. Okay, so he's at a museum, and he sees this painting. Um, and the painting <coughs> is titled Ecce Homo in Latin, um, and it depicts... The picture of the Lord Jesus uh, right prior to when he was crucified and he's been beaten and scourged and he has the crown of thorns and the bloods running down and they have thrown the purple robe over him and the people had chanted, we want Barabbas crucified Jesus. And so Pilate brings Jesus forth in this condition and the only two words that are recorded in the gospel that Pilate says is he says that, he says ecce homo, he says behold the man, behold the man. Um, and I was reading that account, and it said that the count, when he was looking at that picture of Jesus with that caption, Behold the man, that he felt the power of God fall on him. And his eyes were opened to his own sinful condition. His eyes were opened uh, to his selfishness. And he felt as though the next words that were written at the bottom, that Jesus was speaking these words to him. And those words said, This I have suffered for you, now what will you do for me? This I have suffered for you, now what? Will you do for me? And he said in his biography that never again did he view his life as his own. Never again did he ask whose he was or, or how much his salvation cost. Or never again did he ask for what was I purposed, or purchased. sorry, Because he saw his life as purchased by God. This I have done for you, now what will you do for me? It rang in his head as he said over and over and over. He was purchased for the glory of God sent on the mission of God for the purpose of God. And he sold his life for this. He sold his life for this. If you know the story, it says the count gave himself to the Lord and, and before he gave up all of his possessions and all of his money and all of his titles and his honor in this, in this, in this world, he uh, welcomed in the Moravians. They were a group of Christians who had been persecuted and he welcomed them onto his land and by his guidance and with this focus on the, the glory and the worth and the majesty and the cost of what our salvation cost Jesus. It changed those people, and the power of God fell on them, and, and, and they had a, a prayer service that lasted for 100 years. That was 24 hours a day. And I think about that. This was only like a couple hundred people. And I'm like, we, I don't know how your guys' prayer and fasting went, but ours was 
you know, you get like four people, you know, at 6 a.m. and five people at 6 p.m. And it's, anyway, uh, these people. Uh, for a hundred years, for a hundred years, they had a round-the-clock prayer service. They sent out missionaries, hundreds of them. Twenty of the first 29 were killed, and they just kept going. They just kept going. And when we hear those stories, we shouldn't think like, oh, well, that's really cool. Um, that's my internal voice. That's what it sounds like. Or, oh, I wish I could be like that. Or, oh, I'm super convicted because I'm not doing that. We should ask ourselves, like, why or how, right? These are real people with real stories that had a real experience. And we shouldn't be like, oh, I'm convicted that they did something greater than us or whatever. We should be like, well, how did they, how did they do that? How did they do that thing? I want to do that thing, and I want to know what this, the secret was. How were they able to crush you know, their offense and their expectations and their entanglement with the world so that they could just pursue uh, this, this mission that God had for them? And the answer was from the, was, was from the painting. They had beheld the man. They had beheld the glory of Christ. Just like John 1.14, it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. We've seen his glory. The glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. They had an experience with God where their eyes were opened and they saw the glory and the worth and the majesty of the Lord Jesus. They saw him, they beheld the man, and they were changed. It was really convicting for me when I was writing this, by the way. I was, uh, we never even think about that. You know, this I have suffered for you, now what will you, what will you do for me? Like, it doesn't usually really cross our mind, but... But it crossed their mind um, when they beheld the man. And the Apostle Paul, when he beheld the man, Jesus, his life was radically changed too. Uh, in Philippians 3.8, he said this. He said, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. He lost everything. We know the Apostle Paul. He lost everything. Literally everything. He lost his money and his prestige and his, and his following as a Pharisee, his place um, in the religious center. He, he, he was maligned and persecuted and beaten and shipwrecked and abused and made fun of and, and scorned in every account. He had no kids or marriage or retirement or 401K or F-150s or white picket fences or whatever. He had, none of, he had nothing. He had given it all. He had become less. He had become less. He had become nothing. And what he says in this verse is, you know what? It's glorious. I know my Jesus. I have my Jesus. In light of what I have in Christ, he says everything else is trash. He's like, just give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. I love it. And it isn't just give me Jesus. It's sort of that heart... Um, Sort of that heart where he says, like, like, I will do anything for it. He's like, just take it all. It's all junk anyway. Just take it. It's, it's not that we're earning our, our forgiveness, but it's this heart that says, I just want Jesus. I will do anything to get him. I will do anything to get him. That's what he says at the end. In order that I might gain Christ. I counted all this junk so I can gain Christ. I love that. I love that. Just give me Jesus. I know that Pastor Kim also shared this story, but from that mission um, started by this guy, Zinzendorf, there was two young men uh, named Leonard Dober and David Nietzschman, um, and they were so sold out for this mission, so sold out uh, for this idea that he has done this for us, now what are we going to do for him? So sold out uh, for the Jesus that they saw when they beheld the man that they sold uh, themselves into slavery. I'm just going to pause because we hear stories in churches and we're like, oh, that's cool. They sold themselves into slavery. I had a really hard time giving up my mornings and evenings during fast week. I hate the morning. I just want you to know. I would sleep forever if I could. But getting up at six was tough. It was hard. 
I'm being honest. It was tough. I didn't want to do it. I, don't, I gave you my evening. I don't want to give my next morning. But I did, right? But that's where we live. Like, it's hard for us to give up, like, a, a morning or a, a couple-hour block. And these two dudes, they just sold themselves into slavery because so sold out were they for the cause of Christ that they're like, we're going to get to the Indies, and we're going to convert these slaves, and some people are going to know Christ, and that's going to be amazing. We will do anything, anything for him. Anything. And those two men, when they were on the boat um, about to leave, it's just, as the story goes, they're standing at the edge of the boat, and there's a hush that falls over the crowd, and you would expect them to yell something like, pray for us. That's what they sound like. Or what would you yell if you were leaving and never to return? Bye? Who said bye? That's funny. Did you say bye? I like you. Bye. First service, I said, turn off the iron. Um, sorry. So they sold themselves into slavery. They're going to be slaves. They're never going to return. And the thing that they said is they shouted across there to their loved ones. They said, may the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. May the lamb who was slain receive the reward of his suffering. That was their heart's cry. May he receive the reward for his suffering for me. It's from Revelation 5, 9. It says, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You purchased them. That's what they understood. That's why they could be so radically sold out because they understood that by the blood of Christ, he had purchased them and he meant to have them. He meant to be their Lord and their King. He meant to have their obedience. He meant to be the reward and their joy. He meant for them to sell it all and pursue him because he bought them. He bought them. He bought us. And those two men, Leonard and David, they beheld the man in a way that I think we don't, we don't. They saw Jesus, I think, in, in, in a light that, that we have a hard time seeing him. And I, I tried to stir it up um, in first service, and I'll do it again, but we think about the cross, and it's just such this, we've heard it so many times. It loses its power, and we don't truly think about what is going on there. We don't think that the fact that, that Jesus, who was, who was on the cross, died a death that I deserve. I know we know that, but we don't think that. Like, we don't internalize, like, I actually deserve to be crucified because of my sins. That's hard for us to internalize. And sometimes we don't really believe it. And it's so much more than that because that Jesus, he was, he was the son of the living God. He was co-eternal and co-creator, and he's all-powerful, and he's lived and existed in perfect unity with God forever. And he was the one that was on the cross for my sins. And it's more than that, because the Bible says that he became sin for us. And so Jesus, God in the flesh, who has lived for infinite years in perfect holiness, now is not just bearing my sin, but becoming my sin. And he's bearing the wrath of God. Billions of people for billions of years, the cost of all of that was poured on our Jesus on the cross. It's crazy to imagine. He bought something that day. He bought something. He bought us that day. Acts 20, 28, speaking of the church, says he obtained us. He obtained us with, with his blood. Uh, 1 Corinthians six twenty says, you were bought with a price. I was bought. You were bought. And those men, they recognized it when they were standing at the back of the boat and they proclaimed, may the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. And we don't usually think, <laughs> what did he purchase for himself? What is the reward of his suffering? We think of the cross, and we generally think just one way. We think, what, what do I get? <laughs> what do I get from this thing? I get forgiveness, and I get reconciliation with the Father, and I, my sins are atoned for, and I can have the Holy Spirit, and I get to go to heaven. Um, I get a lot of stuff. Um, and we don't think about what does Christ get out of it? What does he get out of it? And because we don't, we only, 
We only think of the cross as this place uh, where we come and we pile our sins and we just heap them there day after day and week after week and month after month. And it's good. You should take your sins to the cross because that's where they're forgiven. But that's be- that, becomes, um, that becomes all that it is. And we go to the cross um, and, we, and we're, we, for more health and more wealth and better relationships and whatever we come to. And we beat on the cross and we beat on the cross and we beat on the cross and we say, in Jesus' name, do this thing. In Jesus' name, do this thing. And we turn the cross into this thing that, that is just about us. And we... We get offended. Um, we don't get it. It's crazy. It's crazy. Um, at the cross, Christ purchased more than just, just our forgiveness. Um, there is a reward of a suffering. He, he deserves it all. Um, there's lots of things. Christ purchased our holiness at the cross. He purchased good works. He purchased zeal. He purchased us to walk worthy. I'm going to read a bunch of verses. But he purchased things for himself, and we never think about it. But he means, he means to have those things. And if, and if you're, sorry, my pants are annoying me. And if you're, um, if, you, if you're thinking, this, this is sounding kind of legalistic. Sounds a little bit like now I'm supposed to be doing some stuff, and I didn't think I had to do anything. Um, that's dumb, so don't think that. Uh, it's just dumb to think that I'm going to glory, I'm going to live forever, I get immortality, and Jesus, you get nothing. It doesn't make any sense. He bought our lives. He bought our obedience. He bought everything. One verse is Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. It says, Husbands, love your wife just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy, but holy. He bled and died for the church's holiness, not just for our salvation. The reward of his suffering, what he gained or what he was getting uh, from that cross was more than just to forgive us. He wanted a bride that was pure. He wanted a bride that was pleasing, that was radiant, that was blameless. He purchased that. He purchased our holiness because he's worthy. Titus 2.4 says, He gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people of his own possession who are zealous for good works. He gave himself to gain a people who are zealous for good works, who really want to do good stuff. They really want to get out there and do it. He purchased our good works with his blood. You don't want to go to the fasting or prayer time. It doesn't matter. He purchased that time. Just go. You know, you don't want to be nice to your neighbor. It doesn't matter. Nobody likes your neighbor. That doesn't matter. You don't like your neighbor. God doesn't like your neighbor. No, God loves your neighbor. It doesn't matter. He purchased that good work. That we should be a people who are zealous for good works. He deserves it. He's he's worthy. That's the whole message, and that's what Scripture tells us, is that the Holy Spirit opens our eyes to see Jesus. We behold the man, and we are forever changed. We're forever changed. And just to give you some passages of, those, of the changing and things that, that he purchased from our lives, Ephesians 4.1 says, Live worthy of your calling. Ephesians 2.10, You are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Romans 12 says, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Philippians 1, 7, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. 1 Thessalonians 2, 12, walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Hebrews 12, 4, pursue holiness. Pursue it. For without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Pursue holiness. May the lamb who was slain receive the reward of his suffering. That's where this all started, that we realize, we internalize, and we live in such a way that we understand that he purchased not just our forgiveness, but that he purchased everything. He purchased everything. And he's worthy of it. It isn't like we're begrudging. It's like he's worthy of it. We want to give it to him. We want to give it to him. Um... I made the example of the not, I'm almost done, so don't panic. Um, 
I gave the example about not wanting to fast and pray because that's my world. The 6 a.m. especially, what I talked about, I don't like getting up. Um, but one thing I did receive, receive um, from the Lord during that time was essentially this message was the reminder of this. And I, in my offense, was on my knees and figuratively, but maybe not as much figuratively, beating, beating at the cross about what I needed. I needed more. I needed more blessings. I wanted to see some more fruit in Mondovi. I would like some more fruit. I need some equipping, clearly, you know, I need some more of the Holy Spirit. I need, another, I need more gifts. I need something. God, I need something. If this is going to work, you need to give it to me. And I was offended. I was offended. What am I doing working 70 hours a week for this? What am I doing? I want some fruit. I'm just being real. Is it okay for real? Good. That's what God says. He, there was a song that was playing. Um, and in, in the song was the words that we've talked about, but it said, to win, to win for the lamb the reward of his suffering. I lay my life down. I lay my life down. And if that's the heart's cry, and that's what God spoke to me, is that it doesn't, it doesn't matter if I can see what he's doing. It doesn't matter if I get the accolades of having you know, a big church. None of it matters. What matters is that he's worthy of my time. He's worthy of every effort every breath, he's worthy of it all because he bought it. He bought it. And so we can lay our life down and we can crush our offense and our bitterness against God when we realize that we have no right to it. We have no right to it. And so as I sort of wrap this up, um, I just want you to think about that until, until we sort of internalize this, that may the lamb who was slain receive the reward of his suffering, until we actually care or believe that that's true, like nothing changes in our lives. Nothing changes. Like we won't, we won't fast and we won't pray and we won't forgive and we won't tell our neighbors about Jesus and we won't share him with our friends or our coworkers or we won't crush, you know, certain sins or entanglements that we struggled with for years. We won't do any of the things that we know we should do until he becomes worthy of us doing them. Until we realize that it isn't just our forgiveness that he purchased, but he purchased our lives and our obedience too. At least that's what he told me. It's actually, I think, an encouraging message. It doesn't come off encouraging, but it is. Because when you have a soft gospel, when you have just sin as much as you want, do whatever you want, it doesn't mean anything. Our God isn't little. <laughs> Our Jesus isn't small. He isn't, you know, to be rolled in the mud. Our Jesus is, is the mighty God. He's the king of glory. And he purchased us. That's a good God to serve. That's a good savior to follow. And so... Whatever the struggle happens to be in your life or wherever the striving is or, or whatever the thing is that you want, just to remember that he's worthy. He's worthy of your obedience in the midst of it. He's worthy of you uh, giving him glory in the midst of it. He's worthy of your faith. He's worthy that you press in through the tears. He's worthy that you persevere and that you love him no matter how bad it is. He's worthy until our last breath, until our last breath. And the very last thing is when we think about God and when we think about the cross, we need to stop thinking about what I can get or what is owed to me. The only thing that is owed between us and God, we owe to him. We owe to him. We owe him everything. Everything. He did it all. He paid it all. He offers us everything. But in this life... In this life, he bought it. He means to have it. He purchased it with his blood. And so as we close, I'm just going to pray, but let, join me in pursuing that. That changed this guy's life. It changed the Moravians. It changed 
Apostle Paul, it changes everybody when they behold the worth and the value of the Lord Jesus and realize that he has done it all. Then they do it all. And everything changes. Heavenly Father, as we respond in worship, God, I ask that this would be the cry of our hearts. God, that we would begin to desire your glory more than our pleasure. Father, that we would care to make your name great more than anything else. Father, forgive us for thinking that you weren't worthy of our lives. Father, forgive me. Forgive me, Father. Father, I just ask as we respond that you would stir it up in our heart, that we would never forget that you are worthy of our lives, that we would never forget that you are the king of glory and you are on the throne, that you are on the throne. Father, we lay our lives down. We lay our lives down. Amen.